So I am joined today on the podcast by the lovely David, David Boyles. Welcome. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, come and chat with us. So our, our broad overarching theme today is going to be marketing for purpose. Um, but before we sort of get into the, the nuts and bolts of that, do you want to give us a bit of a, an intro, a bit of an overview in your uh, career history to date, David? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hello, everyone. So this is the first podcast I've done. So <laughs> Inaugural. You, like you're all hundreds of you listening, but um, yeah, there delighted will be. to be here. There will be. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, really delighted um, to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. So I've worked in marketing for around 13, 14 years now. Um, and I kind of, I was going back to the early stages, coming out of university with a, a degree in marketing. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. Um, so I kind of entered the very competitive London graduate scheme world. And I was like, right, I'll just apply to anything I can. And that'll kind of be the start of my journey. Um, funny enough, I did a, an internship in PR for three months and was told, nah, this isn't right for you. You're far too apologetic. So <laughs> PR was crossed off the list. But um great. I then, yeah, I then ended People up People like, you can't do this. <laughs> oh yeah. I, well yes. They're like, oh you need to be a lot more, you know, pester them more, be more resilient. I'm like, oh I don't want to do that. <laughs> but um yeah, then kind of ended up, I suppose by luck, I came across um WPP who I think most people have heard of had mm. almost like a, an entry level scheme where you'd go and work in the post room um, and you know you work in the post room the canteen the switchboards and they as kind of the, the payoff for doing that um, if a graduate role came up in any of the organizations in that building you got the first interview and okay. yeah so that's how I ended up starting my career at Ogilvy um now how long did you have to do in the post room before you got only in? three months um <laughs> which was not oh, too God. bad yeah. do you know what I quite enjoyed it it was yeah. a, a nine to five you could turn off at the end of each day um but yeah I ended up um getting placed in Ogilvy um which for kind of a, a graduate role was yeah. a Amazing. dream name to yeah. be working um ironically considering that this is a for purpose you know, marketing for purpose podcast. The first client I worked on was a tobacco brand. Um, yeah, but you know what? I was, I was a little bit hesitant at first, but then I was like, "Come on, look at the opportunities for uh, this amazing agency." Um, but also, it was on a European account, mm. so myself and my team would have been res well were responsible for thirty eight European wow. markets. Huge, yeah. Um, and it produced, yeah, it was huge. And I think in terms of like a first role and the development opportunity, the complexity of stakeholder management, and it was a really integrated account, everything from TV all the way through to shopper, depending on like, the legal legislations in each of mm. those markets. In Russia, you can do anything to it related mm. to tobacco, whereas the UK and Ireland... You can like put a little sticker on a shelf now. Yeah. So really interesting first role. And then kind of within Ogilvy, I then moved on to various other accounts before moving to Australia, to Sydney when I was 25. It's um, a long and, path, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, of course. And it's funny, people are like, oh, did you notice any difference when you went from London to Sydney? And in terms of advertising, no. Because the agencies in London are full of Australians and the agencies in oh, yeah. Australia are full of Brits. So it kind of <laughs> just classic. a real simple cultural transition. Um, and yeah, I think maybe, you know, taking that sacrifice and working on a tobacco brand really paid off when I arrived here. Because having mm -hmm. the Ogilvy name on my CV kind of opened up a fair bit of opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked kind of, I think, about years in Sydney at various advertising agencies um, across brands like Adidas, Shell, Emirates, Jacob Creek. So a nice broad range mm. of categories. Um, and do you know what? I kind of got to the stage where 
you know, advertising is hard. It's a hard mm. industry and you work really hard, but the payoff is the kind of the discipline and the skill sets you get from it. And mm. also the people you meet. I've met, you know, friends that I'll have for life through agency world. So mm. I don't want to sound like I'm about to bag off agencies because I'm really grateful for the experience mm. that it gave me. But I kind of got to a stage where I just wasn't very happy in work anymore. Mm. I was fe- waking up on Saturday mornings, feeling anxious about client deadlines in the coming weeks. And that, I suppose, came with seniority as you develop yeah. through the rank. Yeah. Um, and I was like, nah, I'm going to have a career change. So I'm going to go and become a teacher. Okay. And I applied to become a primary school teacher. Wow. I got my place. And the paperwork came through. And I was like, 24 grand that's not right and I phoned them up and they're like oh yeah you're an international student I was like no no just I was like I'm an Australian citizen now yeah and they'd assumed because all of my education was done in the Uh, UK that I was international and they're like oh sorry our domestic quota is full but you can come as an international that was essentially like nah no thank Um, you So back into advertising. Thank you. (laughs) 24 grand. Um, So far in Sydney, is it? (laughs) No. Um, So I went back into advertising for another year, but really started to kind of look at what I do outside in my personal life to kind of just get a bit of purpose Mm. back in my life. And I started volunteering um, in homeless shelters. Um, did a lot of volunteer work for the Leukemia Foundation. It's a cause that's really close to me. Um, and then I was kind of researching into disability support. And I came across this organi- amazing organization called Higher Up and researched and I was like, wow. Um, and then saw that they were looking for someone to join their marketing team. Um, and I applied. So that was the beginning of A, my move from agency to client side but mm. also the start of my full purpose journey in the marketing world mm. and um I don't know do you want me to tell you a bit about higher up or yeah, please that'd be great yeah, yeah. Um, so I suppose to give some context um many people on this call probably would have heard of the NDIS which is the mm. National Disability Insurance Scheme essentially an incentive that was introduced by Julia Gillard's government. Um, before NDIS, you know, people living with disabilities and their families essentially had no choice and control in their life. The government, mm. government, I've got an orphan ammo. The government would block funds, um, you know, various <laughs> providers, <laughs> yeah, various providers, organizations, and they would essentially dictate to people what services, what supports they could use. You know, there was no. I suppose when you look at that from someone living with disability or their families, that's really disempowering. Mm, totally. And what the NDIS, which I think is one of the most amazing things to happen to this country, considering that one in five Australians live with a disability. Gosh, is it is that actually, high? Wow. Yeah, it's a huge number. Wow. Um, okay. And I think the um, awareness around disability, particularly... Um, kind of more intellectual disabilities, the autism spectrum. There's a lot mm. more awareness around that now, mm. and people are getting tested at a lot younger age. Um, um, and I think you know, popular culture is also finally there's a long way to go, but starting to do a better job at kind mm. of raising awareness around that. But what the NDIS um, essentially did was to you know, if you have a disability, you can apply for an NDIS plan where you're allocated funding to use for services or supports, um, basically to cater for your requirements. Mm. They can then choose what services they use, who supports them. And that's essentially how Higher Up was born. Um, Mm. It's two amazing co-founders, Jordan and Laura O'Reilly, who grew up with a rubber um Shane who lived with disability and they experienced firsthand what that was like for them as a family to have random support workers knocking at the door 7 a.m um who he'd never met before it'd be a new you know it was like a a merry-go-round of support workers 
Um, and so they set up this online platform where essentially it's two-sided. On one side, you have a huge pool of verified and qualified support workers. And on the other side, you have people seeking support where they can go onto the platform, they can enter whatever their requirements are, they're served a pool of support workers, they can then book them, you know, and then higher up also deals all the back ends, the, the insurance, the payroll, um, the quality and safeguards. So essentially it was this um, kind of one of the first responders, it's mm. kind of new age um, kind of disability approach yeah. compared to the very traditional market. Mm. Um, and that's where I, sorry, am I getting long winded or is this all no, right? No, no, it's, it's really interesting. No. Yeah, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can natter a bit, so just cut me off if I am. But um, um, so yeah, I kind of came on as one of the original members of the marketing team and um, how big were they at that stage when you joined how many people were there around 35 okay um but okay. in marketing there were two as a, a wonderful content manager and like someone in a um who's also wonderful in like a graduate mm -hmm. role who was essentially doing everything everything um, yeah. yes um so yeah, kind of came on initially in like a brand role with my first, the first kind of purpose, well, purpose, my first KPIs essentially were to really develop the strategic brand framework. Mm -hmm. So everything from your, your internal facing elements, your purpose, your core operating principles, through to those more external facing, um, you know, your uh, positioning, your propositions, your brand behaviors, tone of voice, and so on. Um, so once we had that set up, I kind of then took on really a, part of my role as a guardianship role, making mm -hmm. sure that every touch point, not just in marketing, but across the business kind of laddered up and reflected our brand. Um, but also then really on the, the campaign um, kind of focus as well, which is where my agency experience came into play, yeah. um, producing integrated campaigns, um, and to really just focus a lot, large focus on me was the kind of the awareness piece. Um, mm. And it was quite the journey. It was, um, you know, I was there just shy of four years and we went from, you know, 35 to 400 people in HQ. It's and it amazing. was, yeah, it was amazing. And it was an invaluable experience to mm. be part of startup, to scale up. So, yeah. You know. yeah. Um, and, I absolutely adored it. It was to date the happiest I've ever been. Um, but I kind of got a stage when people are like, my God, you're a jobs work. Why are you leaving this place you love so much? <laughs> um, and I kind of just got to a stage where, A, I fancied a change of city and I moved mm. to Melbourne. A bit impulsive, but can't be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I, on reflection, we kind of got to this size. Mm. Um, and I really missed the excitement of being a startup again, that, that small environment where everyone rolls their sleeves up. There's a yeah. real go get attitude. It's, yeah. it's quite electric um, if you think about it. And um, I wanted to stand for purpose for sure. Um, but I wanted to go smaller. I wanted to kind of focus on that transformational piece again. Mm. Uh, and that's where I am now. I've, again, still in disability, but another amazing um, disability provider called Carer Solutions. Um, we've been just shy of three months. Um, so that was, a, that was quite yeah. the lo a long introduction. But no, yes, but it's, it's super <laughs> interesting. And I think, um, like I said to you before, I think it's always super fascinating how people have either intentionally or not but they've kind of built their careers and and how they've kind of gone from one place to another and I think sometimes mm -hmm. it's not until you kind of look back that you can sometimes really see the purpose or the value in something like like the tobacco client and at the time you're a bit hesitant mm -hmm. but then in hindsight you think well when I came to Australia and I said oh I worked at Ogilvy and you know worked on a huge campaign across Europe. I mean, there's just no mm -hmm. scale like that available. Totally. Here. And sometimes I think, yeah, totally. it's just really interesting to see how the, I guess, the dots connect um, over mm. over people's careers. Yeah. I think 
there's um there's two two main kind of topics that I'm really keen to to talk to you about. One is obviously the the for purpose space and and how as a marketer you approach that and I definitely would like to talk about that in a bit more detail I'm, I'm really mm. interested in that um but before we do that I might just um touch on the uh the startup you mentioned it there the mm. kind of startup scale up when you joined there were 35 people when you left it was in the 400s um yeah, yeah. just really interested in I guess how that experience was um, just working for a, a, mm. a business that grew that fast, firstly, and secondly, how that was as a marketer and, and how your, I guess, approach and, and focus would kind of flex and change with that. Yeah, um, definitely. It's definitely a different environment, that's yeah. for sure. Um, and you've got to be adaptable, um, flexible, it's the same thing, but um, and, and, and willing to kind mm. of be um that's if you are to enter um kind of a startup environment but you know it the rewards are endless like first of all you know if you're in for purpose space you mm. will are normally you know for purpose organizations attract a certain type of person and they mm. are very passionate about doing what they're there to do mm. um and you notice I really noticed that a higher up you arrived and as I mentioned there was that real electricity that you know roll mm. your sleeves up um and that, that was wonderful um I suppose when you kind of look in that being a marketer in a uh, startup space there's kind of three key what, challenges or maybe opportunities is a better way to frame them that you should keep in mind I think the first of all is the first one is your if the co-founder is still in the business is going to be your key stakeholder mm. um, and it's really important I suppose dependent on your level of seniority um, mm. in the marketing team that is the key person to build a relationship with um, you know they obviously it's their baby mm. um, they put a lot of blood sweat and tears probably into setting the organization up um, and I suppose if you're a marketer that you know likes to get their own way maybe Stubborn's not the right word, but not not too responsive to being mm -hmm. told no, no. Then there's something you need to consider because on the other end, you can see the co-founder as someone who has this lived experience, who has these yeah. insights, which you can really utilize. Um, and, and I suppose in terms of managing that person, it's mm -hmm. like take them on the journey of you. Yeah. explain why you're doing things don't last minute be like oh we're gonna go live with this um I suppose if they, if they understand kind of the steps you're going through then and, and you kind of um collaborate with them mm. um that's gonna make working in environments a lot more effective and efficient so yeah number one co-founder is probably one of your most important stakeholders yeah. Number two is kind of leads on quite nicely from that is this educational piece. Um, in startups, you know, there's varying levels of understanding around marketing and what marketing does. I remember my first week, someone came up to me and they're like, oh, so your brand, are you here to like choose our colors and maybe fix our logo? <laughs> I was like, oh, that's like isn't it? <laughs> stereotype 101. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it's, it makes you realize you've got a huge piece to do. First of all, like HQ, mm. what you're doing, why. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, you do see it across organizations, a bit of resentment that marketing's getting this budget, whereas, you know, we're not, um, that lack of understanding why there's investment. Mm. Um, senior stakeholders, EL, your executive leadership team, your board, um, you can have, you know, there can be some obstacles there in, in sure. terms of education. Yeah. You know, I think most people, when they think marketing, if they've got a general understanding, they go straight to digital, which mm. is understandable. You see your results pretty quickly. It's quite black and white. You know, you can look at a dashboard and see your clicks, your conversion, your website traffic, whatever it might be. But then when it comes to investing in brands, yeah. which is more of a long term thing, yeah. uh, you want that much money to do this. Like, I don't care if our unprompted brand awareness goes up 3%. I want to see registrations. Yeah. Um, so it's more of a kind of an education piece and, you know, taking them through the whole 
customer journey from their yeah. initial awareness all the way through to conversion, all the way through to retention, um, and really just educating them and taking them on the journey again. And the third piece is is kind of what I call the marketing tap, which is, you know, you need to, in a startup environment, be really conscious of when you turn it up and when you turn it down. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got to be conscious that you're all relatively new. The teams across the organization are still finding their operating rhythms, their, you mm-hmm. know, their ways of working. And I think higher up, there's a great example of, um, you know, Hire a real personalized service approach. It's not automated. You know, when we speak to member, we, when they, sp- actually, I can say we, I used to work there. Um, <laughs> when they, uh, when we the speak way. to members, of- <laughs> yeah. we speak to the community, it's not, um, you know, it's not a robot. It's actually mm. someone on the other end of the phone making sure it's the right fit for them, doing all the, you know, safety checks on their support workers, the reference checks. Um, and as a result, you know, when marketing has the tap up too much and suddenly there's an influx of registrations and inquiries, we weren't always conscious and it was a learning of mm. what the knock on effect is from a customer experience point of view. You know, suddenly people were waiting three or four days to get a response because of the cues. So we'd yeah. we would have our head of onboarding being like, marketing, whatever you're doing, stop. We can't keep up. Um, so again, you're doing really your job too better. well. Please, please yeah. stop. Oh my god, it's a marketer's dream. It's like our KPIs tick tick tick. <laughs> but then at the same time, when you look at the broad brand, yeah, you're jeopardizing. Yeah. It. Um, so yeah, I think just really talk to the teams, see what their, you know, their uh, capacity is like, and then make sure that they're prepared so that they can resource mm-hmm. accordingly when you're going to tap right up. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned there, which is something I hear, I mean, I hear it all the time across kind of all industries and types of business, but it does seem particularly prevalent in the startup and probably more so the tech startup space and mm. what you were mentioning there about obviously the the founder co-founder is is super involved it's their baby it's it's their business mm. and whether or not that person understands and or values marketing is actually key to the success of your role um and mm. i think some of the conversations that i've had with people over the years when that hasn't been the case and it doesn't matter how much they educate yeah. they they just can't mm-hmm. get there um yeah how how did you sort of go about that in the early days you, you mentioned kind of bringing them on the journey is it a case of being able to show you know wins and and showing how it how it is working or um did you have a founder yeah. that was particularly receptive? Is there anything that you can kind of put your finger on there that made the difference? Definitely. Um, well, luckily, like both the founders I've worked at, at um, with, sorry, um, Higher Up and Care Solutions are pro-marketing, which is makes life yeah. a lot easier. <laughs> it's a big, <laughs> One big thing. Yeah, obviously, you know, they're not going to agree with everything. That's, yeah. you know, mm. that's their job. Um mm. I think particularly in like for purpose, you have to validate things with community insights. You cannot work in silo and assume that you know what the answer is. Um, and the more you can gather insight from the end, mm-hmm. the customer, the person that's actually using a service, and the more you can validate what you're, uh, what you're presenting, I think the easier it is to get it over the line um, and I think with, you know, disability, it's uh, it's really hard to do that sometimes because mm. it is an extremely diverse community. Mm. You know, as I mentioned, one in five, you're talking mm. millions of people with different mm. disability types, support needs. Outside of that, you then have the workforce, the support worker workforce. Mm. You then have, you know, government stakeholders, you know, uh, policy decision makers, you know, it's it's really broad. So sometimes it's quite hard to be like, oh, yeah, we're just using this standard, mm. you know, strategic approach. You actually have to talk to who you want to target, 
get gather their insights. And I think the worst thing you can do, and I've heard this before, is um, so I'm going a little bit off track here, but for when you hear that you get feedback, oh, it's obvious that marketing team have worked in silo and they're mm-hmm. all of able body and able mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and you see a lot of brands in the disability space who unfortunately are a bit like that and they mm-hmm. kind of go down this really condescending aspirational route um, as, a, as opposed to like your more really candid mm-hmm. representation where you can really demonstrate that you understand you know what support they require what support looks like and I think kind of laddering back up again to how do you get a founder over the line it's mm. really demonstrating that you've listened and learned from the mm. people you want to target mm. um and yeah i think that's probably the main thing it's like do not work in silo get your insights um and use that to to really back what you're presenting yeah I, that point about audience obviously super super key mm. broadly looking back on it and and perhaps even in, in your current role today do you do you approach marketing and I appreciate this is a super broad question feel free to to kind Mm. of chunk it down but do you approach marketing differently in a full purpose organization do you think there's a a different kind of thought process or framework talk to me about that I like marketing has brought you know I kind of reference that you have your when you go back to your initial strategic brand framework, you have your um, internal facing pieces, mm-hmm. uh, your, your purpose, your operating principles, and we can potentially talk about that in a minute, but then your internal facing, um, you know, your positioning, your props. And I think in, I can't talk on behalf of all brands, mm-hmm. but from my kind of agency experience, you do notice that a lot of brands I worked have really had this is our proposition. Uh, this is our positioning for the year. This is our prop for the year. And, you mm. know, every reverse agency brief had to ladder up to that. I think in terms of disability space, um, with that diversity, you have to just, you can't be, yeah, you can be quite high level, but you've really got to look at each cohort. Mm. Um, and instead of having, you know, one positioning statement and one proposition that SAT framework that you looked at every day mm. uh, in in terms of positioning I kind of prefer to look at positioning nudges so for example government space that's a mm. cohort where are we on kind of the advocacy scale are we going to be aiders or are we going to be at the other end which is like you know whack your Mel Gibson brave heart face on and join the unionists <laughs> it's like where do you sit on that scale yeah. um and you kind of do that against all the different cohorts for positioning and then proposition. It's really who you, and we kind of came up props per activity. We needed to understand what the problem we were trying to solve is and who we were targeting. Mm. You know, we, you know it's, one day it could be a parent. It's a different problem you need to solve as opposed to, you know, a, a 50 year old male living with autism. You know, mm. It's very, very different. So, um, Again, a bit more flexible. It's, you don't work so formulaic. You have to take each yeah. activity piece by piece. And then um, I suppose this could be a, maybe a separate question, but um, the, the whole purpose piece. Mm. Um, purpose is really important in a full purpose organization. That's something you actually have to live. It can't be lip service. Mm. Um you know, I think uh, a brand that does purpose incredibly well is Volvo. Like if I say to you, Emma, like, what is, what would you think? When you think of, when you, Volvo, what do you think? What's the first thing that springs to mind? Swedish always. I think of Swedish oh, okay. Sweden <laughs> snow, but, <laughs> but uh, also that they have that whole thing of kind of safety and environmental yeah. concerns and yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Their whole purpose is to save lives. Mm. Um, and the fact that you just said safety it means they've done probably quite a, a good job at that and you know everything from you know what how they communicate but you know Volvo 
um, actually like took the patent off and shared the information for their the technology behind their seatbelts. Okay. Um, they're like, yes, we're going to give information to competitors, but yeah. if it's going to save lives, we're yeah. going to put that before yeah. anything else. So it's really important um, for a full purpose organization that, you know, and it comes from the co-founder as well, the founders, Rob and the Bob, you are living your purpose um it could be it can be quite hard to get a purpose right particularly when you're producing it from scratch because you know you look at the the list of what a good purpose statement needs to be it needs to be inspiring it needs to be rememberable um i think the most important thing is it needs to be measurable and you need to be able to execute against it Mm. um and i was at higher up um we kind of got to this a purpose statement of to enable the pursuit of a good life for everyone now some people might be like oh that's not very original you know that's one of the most common you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs you know everyone wants the good life but it was actually something you know we look at how broad our stakeholders are mm. you know, the, the community the people in HQ government whoever it might be and it's something that should apply to everyone. And once we kind of landed on that, it was really our responsibility to make sure we executed against that mm. the whole time. So everything from, you know, in IROP invested a lot of money into making the physical office space accessible for everyone. You know, not just a ramp and an accessible bathroom, but mm. accessible kettles, um, height adjustable desks. Um, introduce community grants, um, tracked, you know, we took a cohort of customers and checked in every six months to see if their quality of life had been improving, having, you know, received support through higher up. Um, so I just think it's really important kind of when you approach purpose for a full purpose, um, that it is something you do, you know, as I said, not just lip service, it's something mm. you really live and preach each day yeah and, um, and i'm really saying... conscious i've just <laughs> really given a really long answer <laughs> to your that's, that's how it should be people are here to listen to you not <laughs> not me so. <laughs> um you mentioned there or, or earlier and and i wonder if that kind of feeds into that sort of for purpose thing that that statement whilst outwardly quite simplistic is is the mm. simpleness of it actually the core of it because if it's too aspirational if it's too you were saying before often in the for, for purpose space you see brands be too aspirational and it's actually not yeah. how someone's living in the real world do you mm. is that kind of part of the challenge finding that that balance yeah. between obviously helping but helping in the real day-to-day sense Definitely. I think it's important. Like a purpose statement does need to be aspirational to a certain mm. extent. Like you need to motivate people to get mm. behind and to work towards it. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, if you ask anyone, you know, we're here to, everyone has a different you know, opinion. You know, for me, it's health and family. And for mm. someone else, it might be safety. For someone else, it might be equal opportunity. Um, so I think we it's something we can all relate to um and we're also really conscious that some people have more opportunities than others mm. so it's it's something great to be behind that i suppose the the balance has to come with when you communicate like yes everything has to add ladder up to that mm. but you know in your campaigns or whatever it might be you don't want to get too aspirational then because you can border on condescending mm. particularly when you know you're sitting in hq as I mentioned, able, you know, the 93, 92, 93% uh, able-bodied, able-minded people, you know, saying this is this. Mm. Um, whereas actually it's, you've got to practice, you preach. Um, yeah. But yeah, there has to be the balance. Yes, it has to be aspirational. It's got to motivate. It's got to be something you really want to strive towards and achieve. Mm. Um, but then you'll be really careful with how you communicate it and ensure that it never comes across condescending mm. particularly yeah. the disability community have been condescended for way too long yeah 
You were saying um, earlier when you were talking about, um, I was going to say purposefully choosing for purpose. Ha ha, didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> on purpose again, can't stop saying it. When, <laughs> that it was an active decision, let's use that word on your part, to go into the for purpose space. Mm. And there you've been there for four or five years. Um, yeah. Was it what you expected? Yes. Yes and no. Um, yes, in terms of I knew I was going to get so much more job satisfaction. I knew it was kind of quite aligned, more aligned to some of my values. Um, and I knew I was going to be working with really passionate people. I suppose the one thing you kind of sometimes take for granted is, um, and it kind of goes back to that educational piece, is... Um, you know, you're, you think you're doing this amazing work, but not er everyone might not agree with that. And I think a, a good example of that was when we did um, at Higher Up uh, Brand Identity Refresh. Now, the reason we did that was for accessibility reasons. We needed to have a color palette, which, you know, was AAA accessible. Uh, we needed to have typography, which was friendly for people with intellectual disabilities or on the autism spectrum. You know, the, the list go on and from um from a kind of a, an external point of view you know we got suddenly as a, a good earning backlash it was like oh my gosh you know you're spending marketing you're spending money on marketing in this i don't care what your colors are like you should mm -hmm. be investing in x y and z and you can't help but take things like that really personally yeah you know you're there so you know you really want to do um good and you want to be you're there for, for the, the sake of the purpose and you know I, I'm quite sensitive and I take things a bit personally more probably more personally than I should have and you know you'd read this feedback and it would kind of because you're so committed to it mm. it does it just does sting a little bit at times and again the the solution to that is make sure you're explaining to everyone yeah. why you're doing it as soon as I reached out to those people and explains, you know, we need to change our colors because at the moment, people with vision impairments are mm. struggling with the color contrast. Mm. Uh, our layouts need to change because they're not friendly. Our, our messaging needs to change. It needs to be a lot more simple. Mm. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of sensitivities that come with it. And I think, you know, when you're really personally committed to something, um, you've just got to, the thing I didn't expect was that I'd mm. take things so personally, but yeah. that may be more of a, a personal trait than yeah. a general yeah. trait, but that's something that I found. Yeah. In terms of um, that brand refresh and, and, and the level of complexity, added complexity when you're um, needing to factor in all of these different things, did you already know those things? How how did you kind of come about that knowledge of, of which colours are accessible and yeah. how do you do that? Do you know what? It was, um, I didn't know it, no. I, um, ele uh, got 11 years, that was 11 years in agency. I wrote many briefs and never once in the mandatory or the considerations yeah. set of that brief did you ever list accessibility yeah how do we make this accessible for everyone uh, maybe sometimes in like a in a act of an experiential activation you might mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. otherwise you never really would um and so suddenly to make it was suddenly you know front of mind and you know one of the brand behaviors was to be acutely accessible mm -hmm. everything we did had to be accessible and with that came a huge learning curve yeah um we did a lot of research into it had to work with you know experts in that space um but it goes so much deeper than just colors and mm -hmm. typography it's um you know one end of the spectrum it's the really simple basic things that anyone can do like a social media manager can just add alt text to a social mm. post it takes an extra minute to describe what's actually going on in the photo. Mm. Um, but people don't think to do that. So and we've all been guilty of it. Mm. And um, then on the other end of the spectrum, you know, are in the workplace, are the, um, is your computer set up with, you know, and is your user experience up for screen readers? Um, it's, it's a, uh, 
a huge yeah. um, topic, um, a really critically important one as well. Um, and yeah, I just think if it's an investment and it's a time investment, things might mm. take a bit longer. And, you know, I remember higher up, we're developing an app and people are like, why is it taking so long? And it's like, because we have to uh, consider all the stability mm. requirements. It's not just like, you know, making something up to scratch as all these additional. Yeah. Um, and I think it's so important, you know, it's, it's one of the things like if I go to a restaurant now, if they don't have, you know, access for an electric wheelchair, like nah. And it's something that I've become quite passionate yeah. about. It's yeah, something, you know, it's all about we, you know, we we just don't consider it. Yeah, it's often the way, isn't it? I mean, I guess it's a little bit mm. of human nature. We're all in our own bubbles to a greater or lesser degree, and then you get exposed mm. to something, whatever that thing might be, and suddenly you have this whole new level of awareness, and you see see the world differently and realize all the stuff that you take for granted and all the mm. stuff that actually we should probably all be grateful for on a daily basis but we're not even aware that it it's different yeah. for other people sometimes totally and you know people take uh, not i'm generalizing way too much there but sometimes organizations want mm. to take the um the more efficient and the more cost yeah. effective route and yeah. they forget about a huge proportion of our population yeah. Or the global population, should I say? Yeah. There's a there's a question that I want to ask here, and I'm not quite sure how to phrase it. So mm. excuse me if I don't do it very well. But how do you how do you balance for purpose with still being for profit? Because it's not a non-profit mm. organization. It's you're still yeah, there to, to make money, but obviously yeah. at the same time for purpose. How do you balance those two things, do you think? Yeah. Uh, uh, question that gets asked quite often with for mm. purpose for profit organizations mm. and essentially it kind of ladders back to the more profit you make the more you can invest into yeah. improving systems employing people getting in terms of higher up you know getting more people available to support more people mm. there's a massive short worker um shortage that's uh, short worker support worker shortage at the moment um you know in metro areas it's okay mm. but you go out to regional yeah. and people can't find support so the more that for profit for purpose organizations can you know grow yeah. and be profitable, the more they can actually invest into solutions mm. um but again that, that the for purpose the for purpose and the for profit need to work in unison there yeah um, and I think that's um, a really important point because I mean there's a there's an implicit thought in in the question that sort of imp implies that profit is bad but obviously mm. <laughs> depending on how it's done and, and how the whole organization is run profit in that sense you need the profit to be able to deliver more service mm. to simplistically do more good yeah. um it, it's not intrinsically a bad thing i guess is is kind of the point absolutely it's, it's yeah the and you know, there's context. totally and there's quite a lot of businesses in the disability space at the mm -hmm. moment because there's lots of venture capitalists out there that are seeing you know the ndis dollar it's like oh mm -hmm. this is an opportunity and they come into the space and they're trying to introduce services um and it kind of it's it's a shame because then all have your organizations like care solutions like higher up which mm -hmm. have these co-founders that have you know have lived experience and have worked for years to do the right thing mm. um, and to make sure they live by their purpose um so yeah i suppose it is a full profit for purpose as mm. i said I've, I think yeah. I've spoken to it too much now but just make sure that yeah. they live their purpose and they measure against it yeah yeah I do think it's a really important point and a really important kind of different differentiation mm. but my mm. my final question David it's mm. always my final question here on the uh, on the podcast what do you know now that you wish you knew then I think is to be braver um when you join, go into the startup world. Um, when you're, you know, in the early stages, 
it's your real it's the, the best opportunity you have to really experiment to test channels message creative whatever it might be um and then you can learn from those tests and optimize as you scale up i think coming out of agency world 11 years of it going into mm. higher up into a startup in an agency you don't have that opportunity your purpose is to make your client look good mm. um and they're paying you to get it right first time mm. um and i suppose coming out of 11 years of that i had i suppose i had this like uh, and maybe a bit of fear of failure mm. um and yes experiment be brave don't be reckless but you know if you do fail it's okay mm-hmm. um and I think I'd maybe be if I could go back I'd have been a little less risk adverse mm. I was always like oh my gosh if this doesn't work I'm gonna get reprimanded um and it's really lovely going into care solutions now they foster environment they're like come on let's let's test let's try I'm like, well, we're going to invest this, but I'm not sure what the return mm. on investment is going to be. We'll learn from it. Um, so yeah, be brave is probably, or be braver, experiment, mm. try new things. Don't fear failure, but don't be reckless. That's probably yes. the the key thing. I really I like would that. Yeah. Take away. I um I really like the the be braver. I kind of feel like that's a obviously you're answering it in a work context, but I think in a life mm. context as well, it's a good mm. it's a good message of like you say don't be reckless but you know be brave and and push outside of your comfort zone and try different things and and kind of see see what works i love that thank you it's a really nice place to finish oh good thank Thank you thank you so much um thank you so much for for joining me and and sharing your experience so really interesting and yeah i feel like i've learned i feel like i've learned a lot there so thank you oh awesome i hope it wasn't too too much nattering not at all (laughs) interesting conversations with interesting people it's got to be a natter (laughs) thank you David thank you